This is the time of year when people are trying out lots of new things. They're motivated by the resolutions they made during the New Year's holiday. And resolutions really are designed to get life back on, to, on track. People are determined to get in shape, learn a new skill, or simply improve their lives. People make resolutions because they want a fresh start on life. And resolutions often do lead to a change in behavior, at least in the short term. You know, in the next few weeks, we'll probably see an uptick in people making early trips to the gym or taking a midday walk or watching carefully what they eat. There'll be others who will choose to watch less TV and do more reading. Barnes & Noble will probably sell its fair share of self-help books. And frankly, it seems like there's a self-help book for just about any life issue you can imagine. Now, there, this is obviously a, a time of year that awakens in us a desire to turn over a new leaf and start over uh, in new, all kinds of new ways to seek a fresh start on life. And, and I think we seek this fresh start in all levels of living, in our physical, emotional, even religious lives. But I think the true source of renewal lies with with our spiritual life. If we start there, the other dimensions will fall into place. But if we neglect our spiritual life, no diet or workout routine will be enough on its own to give us the true fresh start that we truly desire and that we really need. A long time ago, there was a man who was in need of renewal. He'd grown tired of dealing with one hardship after another. Though there was a time in life when everything seemed to go right for him. Life was running smoothly. But then somewhere along the way, struggles started to creep in and weigh him down. In fact, things had gotten so bad that he wondered if life was even worth the effort. Now, he turned to self-help programs hoping that those things would help him turn his life around. So he read books, changed his diet, even exercised every day. But none of it had staying power. And eventually he reached a point when he was ready to give up. Now it seems that his biggest problem was that he began to doubt his faith. He looked around at his world and things weren't working out the way he thought they should work. He saw all kinds of contradictions. He was confused. He didn't understand how God could allow some really awful things to happen. See, from his perspective, the good people were being treated poorly while the bad folks were living the high life. The righteous were being run out of town while the ruthless were taking over the places of power. People who played by the rules and lived in decent ways were getting taken advantage of by con artists who lied and cheated to make sure that things came out in their favor. Now, the person that I've described was tired of trying to make sense of life, and he doubted God's goodness. I'm describing the writer of Psalm 73. Now, this psalm is attributed to Asaph. Asaph was a Levite. He was an influential musician in the religious life of ancient Israel. He had been appointed by King David to serve as one of the chief musicians in the temple. He even made a lasting impact on his people by writing 12 different psalms. And that just shows us he had a knack for writing poetry and music that speak to some of the most Uh, some of the deepest concerns of the human heart. Now, we see this at play in Psalm 73, which reads as a lament from a person who's ready to throw in the towel, give up, and walk away. Asaph is tired. He's discouraged, like we are sometimes. And his struggle lies in the fact that while he lived an upright life, he suffers This doesn't make sense to him. He's been faithful to God. And yet, his life is plagued with hardships while those who live in wicked ways, as the scripture puts it, seem to prosper. 
So Asaph was beginning to wonder what good it is to be faithful to God. He says in verses 13 and 14, All in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued. Now doing all the right things didn't lead to the kind of prosperity that he was expecting. If anything, being faithful to God only made life more difficult. See, when he looked around at his world, he became jealous of others. He says in verse 3, For I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now these folks who lived in sinful ways were free of pain and trouble. And they had an abundance of material blessings. Their actions were unethical and immoral, and yet it seemed like they kept getting rewarded. Asaph even provides a long list of their behaviors. He says, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven, and their tongues range over the earth. These are not people we would want to hang out with. They lived in pretty terrible ways. And Asaph was perplexed by this situation. He didn't understand why such sinful behavior was being rewarded, while his own upright behavior got him nowhere. If anything, it seems that doing the right thing led to pain and suffering. None of this made any sense to Asaph because in his mind, good behavior should be rewarded by God. But it wasn't. Now, he was trying to be faithful, but it wasn't doing him much good. And this brings us to the pivotal verse in this scripture. Verse 17 says, until I went into the sanctuary of God. In the sanctuary of God, Asaph found hope and his faith came alive again. In the sanctuary of God, he renewed his relationship with the Lord who can I answer all of his questions. In the sanctuary of God, he saw through the prosperity of those whom he envied. Asaph realizes it was dumb of him to have focused on on their prosperity instead of his own relationship with God. And this change of heart and mind happened in worship. By going to the sanctuary of God to worship the Lord, he has his life readjusted. He gains a clarity of understanding and he discovers a lasting peace in the truth that God is present with him. Now, while we live in a much different time than Asaph, I think we share lots of similarities with him, especially when it comes to a lack of understanding. Now, personally, I regularly come across things that don't make sense to me. There are lots of things I don't understand, and I wonder why God will allow those things to happen. Now, life has a way of stumping us. We do face questions that don't have any good answers. Questions like, why do the innocent suffer? Or, where is God in the face of gross injustice? And on a personal level, I wonder how I can have the kind of faith that will not be shaken by the contradictions that I see at play in our world. You know, answers to questions like these are found in relationship rather than in words. There will always be contradictions in life. There will always be something in life that confuses us. But we can prevail by leaning into the presence of God. And worship brings us into the presence of the Lord, who then helps us in our time of confusion. Asaph speaks to this in verse 23. He says, you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. 
My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The word portion comes from the Hebrew word helic, and it was originally used to designate the share of land that every Israelite was supposed to receive. It indicated that they all would have access to life and that they all would have a future. That's what land was for the Israelites. And so when Asaph says that God is his portion, he's come to the realization that he has found true life in the very presence of God. Now I think there's an important lesson here for us as we stand at the beginning of a new year and consider how we might find a fresh start on life. We need God's presence in our lives, which is where worship comes in because it brings us into the presence of the Lord. Now, there are many different ways we can worship God, and this goes beyond music and worship styles. See, at the heart of worship is our devotion and service to God. Worship involves pouring out our lives to God and seeking understanding for how we ought to live. Now, we can certainly do this with different kinds of music and worship styles. We can do this individually where we set aside time to seek God's presence, listen for his voice, and receive the gifts that are offered. And we can do this by gathering together with our family of faith And when we come together with other believers, as we're doing this morning, we find ourselves surrounded by people who encourage, support, challenge, and affirm us. As we lift up our praises to God and offer our worship to the Lord, we sense that we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. Whenever we worship God, in whatever form it takes, The Lord offers us his presence, guidance, and understanding. Now, worship is sacred space. And we need this space in order to find the renewal we need in getting a fresh start on life. I think people of every generation have known this. And they've carved out special places, sacred spaces, where they can worship the Lord. In ancient times... People piled rocks on top of one another to designate a place sacred. In medieval times, people constructed beautiful, majestic cathedrals as a place where the community could gather and seek God's presence. And this house of worship, where we sit for this service, was created by those who knew that we needed a sacred space in this part of Raleigh so that people could come and seek God's help and guidance for their lives. Now worship was exactly what Asaph needed when he was struggling with life and confused by what he saw happening in the world. Life didn't make any sense to him. He thought good behavior would be rewarded by God. But it didn't. This didn't compute to him. Life was a real struggle. He was confused and confounded by by what he saw until he came into the sanctuary of God. And I think the same happens to us. Now, we can go to the gym. We can read all the self-help books we want in our search for new life. But nothing will substitute for coming into the sanctuary of God. So in this new year, I encourage you to make this one resolution. Resolve to make worship a discipline in your life. This is something you can do by yourself. This is something you can do with our church family. But come to the sanctuary of God regularly and often because it is a place of renewal. It is a place that will help you navigate life's questions and confusions. And so when we come into the presence of God, we do find hope and guidance and help and truth. We find understanding. We find renewal. 
So don't neglect your worship of God. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Oh God, we are thankful for this space where we can worship you. We're thankful for your help and guidance as we deal with the confusions and questions that come with life. We're thankful for the gifts you share with us in worship. And we pray that we would not neglect our worship of you because it is vitally important. It renews us. It inspires us to faithfully follow you and to live the lives you intend us to live. And we lift this prayer up now in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. In just a moment, Paul is going to come forward to sing a song for us. And as he sings, I want you, and I invite you, to reflect on your own worship of God. Is there an obstacle or barrier in your life that's keeping you from more fully worshiping the Lord? And also, what steps might you take this week to connect more deeply with God? So I encourage us all to use this time for prayer and reflection as Paul sings. Paul. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship cause it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath, I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about 
about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus.